evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to share a few words with all of you as we open tonight's program, Bearing Witness, the legacy of Jan Karski today. It's been a privilege to witness the remarkable work that David Strathairn and the Laboratory for Global Performance and Politics have made possible for our community to experience together. Through their collaboration, we are reminded of Jan Karski's powerful and enduring legacy, and we are deeply grateful for all the hard work and creativity that brings us together once again for tonight's conversation. I wish to especially thank Derek Goldman, Chair of our Department of Performing Arts and Director of our Theater and Performance Studies Program, and Ambassador Cynthia Schneider, our SFS Distinguished Professor in the Practice of Diplomacy, who co-founded the lab together in 2012 to bring together ideas of performance and global politics. It is with immense excitement that we have this opportunity to hear reflections from David Strathern as part of tonight's program, together with the Honorable Nancy Pelosi, who we were honored to have join us for the School of Foreign Service centennial performance last November of Remember This, The Lesson of Jan Karski, which David co-wrote alongside Georgetown alum Clark Young and Derek, the play's director. I wish to offer my deep appreciation to Speaker Pelosi for her presence, making tonight's program that much more meaningful. I know how much this moment means to the entire creative team at the lab, and I wish to extend my deepest gratitude to each of them for all that they've done to bring us to this moment. We look forward to the conversation ahead of us this evening and the upcoming feature film release of the play next year. Through the journey we embark as part of this exceptional performance, we're invited to see the life of an extraordinary man, a true hero who we were deeply honored to count as a member of our Georgetown community for so many years. We're reminded of his legacy and the example he set for all of us of what it means to stand for justice and truth. Jan Karski's story is defined by his courage and his heroism in the face of oppression and evil and his enduring efforts to stand against hate and indifference. As one of the first people to provide a firsthand account of the atrocities of the Holocaust, he used his knowledge and perspective as a member of the Polish underground one of the strongest resistance groups in Nazi-occupied Europe to inform allied nations and urge their intervention. His story and its resonance with the challenges we face in our world today is a testament to the values reflected by his journey. For four decades, we had the extraordinary privilege to have Professor Karski as a member of our community. Today, students have a new opportunity to reflect on his life and his leadership through a course focused on Professor Karski and his legacy as part of our Just Communities curriculum, which we'll hear a little bit more about later tonight. I wish to again express my warmest welcome to everyone joining us for our program this evening. I'd now like to introduce the directors of the Laboratory for Global Performance and Politics, Derek Goldman and Cynthia Schneider. Thank you all, and I wish you the very best. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thanks, President DeJoya, for that very generous introduction. I'm Derek, and on behalf of all of us at the Laboratory for Global Performance and Politics, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this evening's event, bearing witness the legacy of Jan Karski today. I can't think of any deeper, more urgent reason for a, a group to be gathering in this moment than to think about and remember uh, Jan Karski. 
Of course, we deeply wish we were able to gather with you in person for this occasion. As theater people and educators at heart, we miss that experience of gathering, of breathing the same air. It's at the heart of all that we do. We ache for it. But we're also grateful for the ability that a virtual platform like this provides to keep moving forward with the important work of connecting, of witnessing, making art, teaching and learning from one another. And it's in that spirit that we put this virtual event together. We're deeply humbled and gratified that there was such, uh, so, met, so much interest, over a thousand people registered for the event, joining us from around the country and around the world to engage with the inspiring and enduring legacy of Jan Karski. Um, so we count our blessings. We look forward to gathering together in 2021. And I pass it over to my colleague, uh, Cynthia Schneider. Thanks very much, uh, Derek. And hello and welcome everyone. Uh, it's fantastic that so many of you have been able to join us. I want to just tell you something about the lab to put tonight's program in context. And then I'll turn back to Derek for a little more background on Karski uh, and the project. The lab is a unique signature joint initiative between the School of Foreign Service and the College of Arts and Sciences at Georgetown. Our mission is humanizing global politics through the power of performance. These two worlds, international affairs and the arts, don't often come together. But after tonight, I hope you'll see why they should and why in particular it makes sense that they do at Georgetown. Derek and I co-founded the lab in 2012, and since then have been hosting events like this that integrate performance and storytelling with timely policy issues. The lab looks at international policy challenges through the perspective of their human impact. The story of Jan Karski perfectly exemplifies the tension between the human moral imperative and broad strategic interests that often guide foreign policy. The lab is active on many fronts. In addition to regularly featuring performances from around the world that engage political issues, we hold a biennial Cross Currents Festival with its culminating event, The Gathering. In the 2019 Cross Currents, we showcased a play from Nigeria about the Chibok girls. Nobel laureate Wole Shoyenka whose words, quote, culture humanizes, politics demonizes, unquote, inspire us every day, delivered a scathing indictment of the Nigerian government's inaction in a long form poem that he premiered at our event. And Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield, recently nominated as the US ambassador to the UN in the incoming and Biden administration, shared with us in the post-show discussion her experiences dealing with the Chibok kidnapping as Assistant Secretary for African Affairs in the State Department. We've been fortunate to host former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright on several occasions, speaking about the intersection of politics and performance personified by her friend, Francois Havel. Derek and I also teach courses in politics and performance, including pre-COVID, a centennial lab course that travels to Cambodia to study the role of the arts in that country's recovery from genocide. The lab's fellows program funded by the Mellon Foundation selects 10 outstanding emerging leaders working at the intersection of politics and performance from around the world. Our second class of 10 fellows was chosen from 190 applicants hailing from more than 60 countries. Georgetown students were so inspired by the fellows program that they recently have formed their own entirely student-led lab student fellows program. And the lab creates our own productions, which tackle many of today's pressing problems. In addition to remember this, the lesson of Jan Karski, these include, I Pledge Allegiance, written and performed by first-generation immigrant students at Georgetown, telling their own stories. Here I Am, a play in process that engages the legacy of slavery at Georgetown and beyond. 
It's written by and stars Mellicent Short Cologne, descendant of slaves sold by the Jesuits in 1838 to keep Georgetown afloat. And finally, In Your Shoes, a performance project that addresses one of the greatest challenges facing our, our country, divisions across political and cultural lines. You'll hear more about this later on in the program from Derek and Ijoma Najaka. I have lived the intersection between culture and politics that lies at the heart of the lab. I served as President Clinton's ambassador to the Netherlands with a background in 17th century Dutch art history, a subject I previously taught at Georgetown. As ambassador, I experienced the power of culture in the context of diplomacy, but also saw that it was marginalized in the State Department. Through the lab and my courses in diplomacy and culture, I'm trying to change that situation. You'll hear Speaker Pelosi talk about the power of the arts to move and persuade. And of course, you've experienced it yourselves. The arts in general and performance in particular, and one day we will all again experience the power of live performance, have a unique capacity to provoke empathy and break down differences something we need desperately today. And now I'll turn back to Derek to tell us more about the incredible Jan Karski and the project. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, the opportunity to engage deeply with Karski's life over the past six years has been life-changing for me and for many on our team. Our journey with Karski really began in 2014 when the Jan Karski Centennial was being celebrated on campus. And I was invited to create something for that occasion to commemorate Karski's life. I was approached because I had some background as a Holocaust educator and theater maker engaging with that history. And I was familiar with the outlines of Karski's life and aware of the iconic commemorative bench on Georgetown's campus. But it was only then that I began to take a deeper dive into this story. And my first and best move was to reach out to two people, my former Georgetown student and frequent collaborator, Clark Young, who became the project's co-author and whom you'll meet in a moment, and the actor, David Strathairn. Um, David and I had worked together a couple of times on projects connected to a shared hero of ours, Studs Terkel, the great oral historian and author. And we've been invoking his name even, even in recent days in relationship to Karski. Um, that hunch to call David was rooted in a sense that at the core of Karski's story was a man of profound humility, a reluctant hero who considered himself, quote, an insignificant little man saw himself as a failure for much of his life. And I knew David himself to not only be an extraordinary actor, but the most deeply humble and generously, generous craftsperson I knew. Someone who I felt could appreciate and ultimately capture the spirit of this extraordinary man. And I remember the phone call vividly and the surprise was that David was actually familiar with Karski's story, had remembered him from viewing the documentary Shoah, the nine hour film, um, and he was all in. And so that first version of the play was presented at Gaston Hall in fall of 2014 as a staged reading with a few days of rehearsal. Uh, many people listening were probably there six years ago. It featured David as Karski and an ensemble of Georgetown students playing a range of roles, including as themselves. And in a sense, they were asking questions of Karski, the great professor, as he looked back on a life that he'd been reluctant to go back to. As he says, choked with tears in the documentary Shoah, I don't go back. The approach of that very first version of centering the experience and the relevance of Karski for students was rooted in an instinct that is still at the heart of this project for us. Uh, a deep sense that Karski, the legendary professor, still has a great deal to teach and to offer us today through his story, especially for the generation of young people like our students who are inheriting new versions of many of the profound challenges that Karski witnessed, lived, and taught about. The piece has evolved over those years through many iterations, um, but the vision behind the project has always stayed deeply tied to how Karski's story resonates with young people like the students who you meet tonight, 
who are now part of our new Just Communities course centered around Karski's life. After that initial performance in Gaston Hall, the project was uh, developed and workshopped in Warsaw as part of the opening of the Poland Museum of the History of Polish Jews, in New York at the Museum of Jewish Heritage on Theater Row, in DC with Shakespeare Theater at the Harmon Center and with the US Holocaust Museum and other sites. In each case over the years, our sense of how much this man's story has to offer has deepened and changed as the world around us has changed and seemed to get even more broken and fractured and polarized. I came to Georgetown in 2005. I never got to meet Jan Karski, but our team has had the privilege of engaging deeply with so many who knew him well, his former students and colleagues who've guided us not only in the historical facts, but in trying to capture something of the spirit of the man. We've also from the beginning had the support and partnership of our friends at the Jan Karski Educational Foundation, whose mission to instill in people, especially youth, the values of leadership, courage, and integrity is precisely the motivation behind our project, exemplified by the life of Jan, of Jan Karski. In 2019, last year, Clark, David, and I determined to turn this work into a one-person solo performance. And after several months of intensive work, with each of them taking turns, staying in my very modest basement, we premiered that piece, Remember This, The Lesson of Jan Karski, last November in Gaston Hall, over two nights as part of the SFS Centennial Celebration, and then in London in January of this year as part of the commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. As you'll learn tonight, the pandemic, as for everyone, significantly altered the course of the project. But thanks to many of the people you'll meet this evening, we've actually been able to move forward in meaningful ways, and we're excited to share those with you tonight. I want to now introduce you co-author of Remember This, Clark Young, without whose amazing work this project would not have happened. And he's going to offer, for those who might not know, a brief overview of Karski's story and life, and then introduce, introduce David, who will perform an excerpt from the production. Thanks again for being here. Thanks, Derek. How are you doing? All right. So. Uh, this is a very abridged version, which is, of course, neither as profound as Karski's life nor as poignant as David's performance. I always uh, hate doing this, but for the context of these conversations, uh, I will. Um, Karski was a Polish Catholic born in a small industrial town, brilliant. He had a photographic memory, an intense love of country. He wanted to serve Poland as an ambassador and was well on his way. Uh, when the Second World War began, he was sent to the uh, Polish-German border. Uh, as an officer at the age of 25, survived the Blitzkrieg, became a refugee, a prisoner of war of both the Soviets and the Germans. He managed to escape by jumping from a train. Karski joined the Polish underground as a courier. Uh, his job was to report to uh, the Polish government in exile on the conditions of Nazi occupied Poland. Um, he was meant to travel uh, mostly by foot to France um, and ultimately he would be sent to London. Uh, when Jewish leaders learned of Karski's mission to London, uh, they begged him to carry their messages as well. Karski agreed. He also agreed to visit the Warsaw Ghetto and a Nazi camp. In 1942, uh, Karski spent two days bearing witness to the degradation of the Warsaw Ghetto and then uh, disguised as a militiaman uh, at a transit camp in Izbeka Lubelska. He witnessed men, women, and children loaded onto cattle trains laced with quicklime. Uh, he was sent to London. In London, Karski reported to his government in exile and notable leaders. Uh, he met with Shmuel Ziegelboim, a Jewish leader who would later commit suicide in protest of allied inaction. Uh, this haunted Karski for the rest of his life. And you'll hear David mention his name shortly. Uh, Karski also met with Foreign Secretary Antony Eden, who would not allow uh, Karski to speak with Prime Minister Churchill. In 1943, at 29 years old, Karski arrived in America, where he reported to Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter, who was Jewish. Uh, Frankfurter told Karski that he didn't believe him, that he thought it was impossible for humanity to be capable of such things. Um, on July 24th, Karski then uh, reported to President Roosevelt. 
Karski told him about what he saw, including his time in the Warsaw ghetto and at a uh, transit camp. But Roosevelt did not ask one single specific question about it, choosing instead to ask about Poland's agricultural economy and Poland's amount of horses. Karski was not allowed to return to Poland. Uh, there were rumors that he had been deciphered. Uh, so instead he stayed in America. And in 1944, Karski uh, wrote Story of a Secret State, which became a bestseller and Book of the Month Club, though most Americans read it with the vigor of a fictional spy novel. Uh, after the war, Karski began studying at Georgetown University where he would teach government and political science for the rest of his life. Uh, he chose not to speak about his wartime experiences for 35 years uh, until a film director, Cloud Landsman, approached him about participating in a documentary Landsman was making called Shoah, which would come out in 1985. He interviewed him in 1978. Very, very reluctantly, Karski agreed. And, and from that point on, Karski became known again. Uh, he began to speak uh, more frequently about his experiences, especially in light of the rise of Holocaust denial. Um, and he began to even speak about this to his students, uh, which is what you will see in this small segment that David will be performing from our play and upcoming film, Remember This. In my classes on government and politics, I tell my students, governments have no souls. They have only their interests in mind. Individuals have souls. The common humanity of people, not the power of governments, is the only real protector of human rights. So I ask you, what is your duty as an individual? Every generation takes up a new revolution. Shmuel Ziegelborn, remember his name. This man loved his people more than he loved himself. Ziegelborn shows us this total helplessness, the indifference of the world. What we are witnessing now is very discouraging. Every generation brings destruction, partition, violence, and yet there is this desire to preserve language, culture, identity. As a boy in Poland, we had to learn many languages because we never knew who would take us over. <laughs> For 35 years, I have never mentioned even to my students that I took part in the war. I wanted to forget that degradation, that humiliation, that dirt. I was forgotten and I wanted to be forgotten. But one day in 1978, I was discovered a man knocks on my door. His name is Claude Landsman, and he is a filmmaker. He says that he is making the greatest film ever to be made about the tragedy of the Jews, and that I would be in this film. He tells me that there will be no actors, no Hollywood nincompoops, only perpetrators, victims, witnesses. And you, Professor Karski, are in the third group. And I will have an interview with you. You are a unique witness. You are a hero. No, no, you will not have interview with me. I am out of it. Hero? No, I am an insignificant little man. But he convinced me. Professor Karski, you are old man. You are going to die soon. You have a historical responsibility. It is your duty to speak. 
And so I did. Thanks, David. Um, after our performance in January in London, we felt that Karski's story was more urgent and relevant than ever with the events of the world. And we were motivated to try to share it as broadly as we could. We were gratified to get many invitations and had plans for the production to have a busy year on the road in 2020, including performances at festivals like Edinburgh and Spoleto, a tour of Poland, and theatric, theatrical runs, both on campus at Georgetown in our Davis Performing Arts Center, at DC's Mosaic Theater, at the McCarter Theater in Princeton, and other sites. And of course, all of this was, was made impossible by the pandemic. But one of the great happy accidents of our performance last January in London was that at the reception following the performance, we met an amazing woman who happened to be in attendance, an accomplished Emmy award-winning documentary filmmaker and Georgetown alum, Eva Anisko. Eva was very generous in her response to the work and asked if we had considered doing anything with film. And at the time, the answer was in a nutshell, not really or not yet. When it became clear in March that our plans for the project this year were evaporating before our eyes, I reached back out to Eva and not only did she embrace the prospect of collaborating, but she proceeded to almost immediately begin doing superhuman work to pull together an incredible team of artists, most especially introducing us to the brilliant Jeff Hutchins, who became the film's co-director with me and its director of photography, and overcoming what seemed insurmountable odds to enable us to shoot a feature film at a studio in Brooklyn this past summer under COVID restrictions. Uh, I wanna welcome her now, my friend and collaborator, Eva Anisko, the producer of the film, Remember This, to tell you a little bit more about the project and introduce the sizzle reel. Thank you, Derek. Um, as Derek mentioned, I was very lucky to catch the London One Night Only event and was moved beyond measure by David's powerful performance and a story that, although rooted in the Holocaust, is as relevant and important today. As a Georgetown graduate and Polish American, whose parents suffered hardships and loss during the war in Poland, I felt intimately connected to the work and compelled to get involved somehow. As Derek said, I met him after the show and we immediately began conversations about the possibility of creating a film version of the play to reach broader audiences globally. With the play on hold due to the pandemic, we decided the time is now. So we quickly, you know, I tapped my trusted collaborators, um, including my amazing co-producer, Alf Hyde, and super talented director of photography, Jeff Hutchins, who also directed the film along with Derek. Jeff's vision was to create a film that matched David's intensity and stamina. And as we shot it in black and white with one camera in the style of a long continuous take. COVID added um, numerous levels of complexity, but I'm happy to report we got crew back to work safely in July and created a COVID-free environment in a large soundstage in Brooklyn. It's been the most wonderful and rewarding collaboration um, and we're close to having a completed 94 minute film, hoping to premiere at film festivals starting early in 2021 and uh, bring it to all of you hopefully soon after that. Um, we're right now super excited to share with you for the very first time an exclusive sneak peek of our sizzle reel. Uh, hope you enjoy, please stay tuned and thank you. Thanks, Eva. Um, and again, the uh, amazing vision for the black and white cinematography and the look of the film is very much tribute to Jeff Hutchins and his team. And we look forward to being able to share the completed film with you, with all of you in 2021. Um, for us at the lab, Karski's story and his example represent more than just a core project. As we've gotten deeper and deeper with this work, we've recognized that his example as a witness connects to everything that we do, 
Um, we've embarked on an initiative called Witnessing Across Difference that embodies our deepest values and animates all of our programs from our global and student fellows programs that you heard about from Cynthia um, to our signature In Your Shoes project, which is rooted in this practice of witnessing across difference, racial, cultural, religious, generational, ideological, all embedded in the values of the Karski story. Um, Working closely with Ijoma and Jaka, who's next to me and who I'll introduce in a moment, um, and with Conservative Christian College, Patrick Henry College, and GU's government department and my colleague Dan Brumberg, campus ministry and Rabbi Rachel Gartner and many others, In Your Shoes brings together communities from very different ideological and cultural perspectives in an environment of deep listening and mutual respect to counter polarization and create spaces for mutual understanding. We understand this work as tied deeply to why we care about Jan Karski's story. Um, one of the most exciting things to happen for the lab over the past year or two has been our deep collaboration with Ijoma and Jaka, um, who serves as the lab's inclusive pedagogy specialist. In that capacity, she's worked closely with Clark and I to design the Just Communities course bearing witness the legacy of Jan Karski today and that we're now co-teaching um, as well as the related website. And she's also been at the heart of these other initiatives like the In Your Shoes project. I wanna welcome Ijoma who'll share a little bit about her work and then introduce you to a few of our students who are part of the Bearing Witness course right now. Thank you so much, Derek. Um, as Derek mentioned, I'm Ijoma and Jaka. And here at Georgetown, I split my time um, between two places. So as Derek said, uh, I'm at the lab where I serve as the inclusive pedagogy specialist. And I also work as a senior project associate for equity centered design at the Red House, which is a unit on campus that functions as an incubator for transformation in higher education. Um, and so I know that's a mouthful. And so what do I actually do? Um, I help students and faculty do the hard work of learning and teaching about hard things. And we use the arts and arts-based techniques to help us do this work. Additionally, um, as Derek said, alongside him and Clark, I co-teach the Bearing Witness class this semester. In essence, the work that we do at the lab is about this idea of bearing witness and more critically witnessing across difference. At the lab, we work on projects that by design help students engage with a diversity of perspectives and stories that lead them to grapple in areas like dialogue across difference or unfamiliar beliefs or ongoing oppressions. And so this summer, when we began designing this class, we wanted to pull these ideas into the course. Um, we knew that we were uh, witnessing and living through this pandemic. We knew that we were witnessing and living through another racial justice reckoning. And we knew that our students knew this as well. And so because this class is part of the Just Communities collection of courses, um, which was created to give students different academic entry points into meeting the moment, um, the process of building this class and its accompanying website was less about getting students to see the connections between history and their lives, and more about holding space for students who know that they're currently bearing witness to something and to decide what that means for them. Some of our students signed up for this class knowing nothing about Karski, and some knew exactly who the man in the statue was. Um, in fact, one of our students' uh, mothers was a student of Karski, so we learned about Karski growing up. And in joining the class, students, um, our students became uh, the first group to see this film. They did sign non-disclosure agreements um, and they got this special access. And so in hearing their thoughtful feedback on the performance in our discussions each week and in the writing that they do, I know our students are actively connected with the legacy of Karski, the way he held the stories of those who were different from him, spoke about the atrocities he saw and asked if there was more yet to do. And our students engage with this in myriad ways. Um, so as a result, I'm thrilled to introduce you to some of the students in the Bearing Witness class this semester who can, in their own words, talk about how Karski's legacy looks today. It's my pleasure to introduce students Lee Meyer, Amina Satterall, and Dominic DeSantis. Hello, all of you. Um, Lee, starting with you, um, could you tell everyone your year and what you're studying? And then I'd love to hear what made you pick this class and what did you think of the film? Um, so hello, I'm Lee. Um, I'm a sophomore transfer and I'm studying linguistics. Um, and what made me choose this class? It was it was Karski. Um, I saw the iconic bench um, and statue after my uh, transfer tour um, early last spring. And I wanted to know so much more about him. And then 
I was looking at the course titles and I found this course and immediately once seeing his name, I was hooked. And then after reading the course description, I saw that it was going to be wonderfully interdisciplinary, that there was going to be aspects of history and, and politics and social justice, really a focus on social justice, but all through the framework of the performing arts. And I was so excited to engage with my own passions and my interest in the performing arts, um, but in a way, in ways, new ways that felt meaningful and connected to the community and my community as a whole. Um, and as this is my first year at Georgetown and I couldn't think of a better way um, to, really, to really start it. Um, despite the pandemic, it's been a wonderful way to engage um, and bring a discussion of personal values and empathy and bearing witness and self-expression into an academic setting. So I've, I've loved it so far. And the film, wow. I think many of you could see from the um, trailer that it's, it's gonna be amazing. And I thought it was really amazing and I was enamored with it. There was so much that I was left with. And one of the things that I think I loved the most and I found the most beautiful was that there was an intersection and it lived in these worlds between theater and cinema. And it was reminiscent of going to the theater, which we haven't been able to do for a while, but it was more than just a recorded production because the way the film was shot, you were so close to Karski and the performance, you had to bear witness. You had, you could not look away. And that's in part because of David's performance is, he makes Karski so personable that at the beginning of the film, Karski is a stranger, but by the end, you feel like you know him a little bit better and you see his full range of emotions throughout the film, every little bit, and that you can't look away. And that really drives the idea and the theme of bearing witness home. And it was beautiful. I hope you all enjoy it when you get to see it. Thanks so much. Um, Amina, I'd like to turn over to you. Um, first, if you can share your, uh, your year and what you're studying. Um, and then I'd love to know about what aspects of Karski's story are resonating with you. Thank you, Ajoma. I'm so happy to be here. My name is Amina. Thank you all for having me. I'm a junior in the SFS studying culture and politics with a focus on migration and mobility. Um, one thing that has really resonated with me about Karski's story and that was incredibly memorable from watching the film was seeing Karski struggle with people's disbelief and denial uh, and even just apathy in the face of the trauma and the atrocities uh, that he was trying to convey and he was speaking his truth of what he has seen. And this has come up a lot for me and, and my closest loved ones in this pandemic. Uh, my family was hit really hard with COVID. My parents are both healthcare workers. And uh, all of that, of course, is awful and painful uh, in and of itself. And there's this other layer of people looking me in the eyes and not seeming to believe that things are as bad as, as they are and, and not believing me or, or not showing empathy beyond some kind of superficial performative empathy for my truth that I'm trying to share. Um, and that's not something that I could have anticipated. And the actual trauma and the, the awfulness is, is sort of compounded by people's reactions that can be very isolating because it feels like being gaslighted. Um, and so watching the film, obviously what, what Karski was bearing witness to is very different from what I'm bearing witness to, but it felt like I, I felt very seen, um, seeing all of the feelings that, that David was, was portraying for us brilliantly, the, the feelings that I heard through the writing and that it, all of it, the experience um, was incredibly memorable because um, I felt less alone even though there's no answers, right, about how to deal with this, I just felt like I wasn't alone in this awful layer to all the awfulness that is already happening with COVID. And um, I felt seen, even though I was the one watching the film. So that was incredibly resonating for me. Thank you so much for that. Oh, that's lovely. Um, Dominic, I'll turn it over to you. Um, can you share your year, what you study? And then um, I'd like to ask you about what connections you've seen between Bearing Witness today, um, especially um, as we think about Bearing Witness across difference. Thank you, Ajoma. My name is Dominic and I'm a sophomore studying government in the Georgetown College. 
In reflecting on Karski's story, I considered how I am bearing witness to the decay of civil discourse and the ideals that are essential for a flourishing democracy. I worry about the disregard for truth and trust that is found in our media of disinformation, politics of division, and culture of exclusion. These issues have come to the forefront in 2020 with the COVID crisis, Black Lives Matter activism, and presidential election. I am especially bearing witness to these concerns of discourse at an intergenerational angle. I'm lucky to be close with both sets of my grandparents, and I spent the lockdown last spring with my grandparents in Florida when the national conversation was elevated amidst these unprecedented times. Like Karski demonstrated in the unprecedented times of the Holocaust genocide, I felt called to use my privilege of the moment to address these issues of injustice and inequality in our country, starting in my own backyard. While my grandparents and I have different education levels, lived experiences, and political perspectives, we approached every conversation with love, assuming the best of intentions. Unfortunately, this is not usually how conversations with strangers go with an increasingly disrespectful, factless, echo chamber driven social media scene. While my generation plays its part by avoiding in person interactions and uh, raising tensions online, I also witnessed with my grandparents how the older generations fall victim to the spread of mass misinformation, especially on Facebook and the breakdown of lifelong relationships over deep partisan divides. Like many people, I try to do my part to raise awareness of these dangers to our democracy and reverse these trends in our society, starting at home and across generational differences. While I see some of my peers write off the older generations because these conversations are inconvenient, just as Karski talked about, I believe that these need to happen. Following the example of Karski's humility, I try to avoid self-righteousness, remove judgment, and listen a whole lot more. In recognizing that there is good and bad in the truth, a truth we must believe, I hope that we can normalize changing opinions and promote dialogue as a means to create, discover, and synthesize ideas for the well-being of our democratic society and all who cherish it. Thank you so much, Dominic. And thank you to all of our students here. It's been um, such a pleasure to be witnessing your work and your thoughts this semester. I'm gonna hand it back over to Cynthia Schneider. Thanks, students, amazing, beautiful. Unmute, unmute, it's gonna be on all of our tombstones. Um, thank you so much, uh, Ijoma and the students. You know, I, I, people, I've taught at Georgetown for a very long time and if anybody asks me why the students, that's the answer and you can see why. Uh, it is now my great pleasure to introduce Ambassador Colleen Bell, who is going to lead us into the conversation between the Speaker of the House and David Strathairn by introducing her friend, Nancy Pelosi. Ambassador Bell is a member of the School of Foreign Service Board of Advisors and is the executive director of the California Film Commission. She served as the US ambassador to Hungary under President Obama from 2014 to 17. As ambassador, she worked on initiatives including economic development, cybersecurity, migration, cultural diplomacy, support for Ukraine and women's issues. She received the Order of Merit Middle Cross, the second highest state order of Hungary and was honored by the American Chamber of Commerce in Hungary for her successful business promotion. But I'm particularly pleased to introduce Ambassador Bell as a friend of the lab who needs no explanation of its mission or the rationale behind an arts-based initiative in the School of Foreign Service. Ambassador Bell also came to diplomacy with a background in the arts. Pretty soon you're all gonna think that's the only way to become an ambassador. Before her diplomatic service, Colleen was a television producer who pioneered embedding social and public health messages in some of the most popular television programs in history. Her work reached more than 40 million people in more than a hundred countries across five continents. Ambassador Bell not only understands but herself has leveraged the power of narrative to bridge differences and to promote empathy and cross-cultural understanding. Thank you so much, Ambassador Bell, for participating in our program. Please tell us about Speaker Pelosi.
if you could just turn on your video, that would be great. Uh, Ambassador Bell and um, unmute. Hi, I'm unmuted and um, I'm join we'll join you in a moment, but I it's coming up that the host uh, has to let me in for the video. So we apologize for this. Thank you so much. Okay, there we go. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Sorry about that technical difficulty there. Um, I, I'm so pleased to be here with you. So yes, I am. I am definitely a friend of the lab and thank you, Ambassador. Snyder for inviting me to be here with you today. I am also the proud parent of Charlotte Bell, Junior Hoya, who loves her school. We have four children, but I have all attended, well, one still in high school, but attended wonderful universities that they absolutely love. But Georgetown kind of in our family has taken it to a next level. Charlotte is home with us. She is virtual schooling. Uh, her eyes still light up when she talks about her professors and what she's learning in school. So well done, Georgetown as a parent. I'm also on the board of the School of Foreign Service as well. So I'm really, really pleased to be here with you today. Um, yes, as, as Cynthia mentioned, you know, I, I, I recognize um, that art raises awareness of different cultures, promotes social cohesion, it strengthens inter intercultural relations. You know, and all of this helps to advance peace, security, and prosperity in the world. Um, this is a time of division. Unfortunately, we have conflict. There are feelings of vulnerability brought on by this pandemic and a general sense of a lack of understanding um, between people and cultures. So there is a need to get to know each other and understand each other, uh, each, under, better, each other better. I know that the power of storytelling and the power of performance can help to shape communal narrative that serves to humanize all of us. You know, the ability through artistic expression to evoke emotion and to touch the hearts and the minds of an audience is extremely powerful. As Cynthia mentioned, I used to work as a television producer and I recognized I, there's a there's a strong kind of activist in me. It was sort of started at a very, very young age. I care about improving the human condition. It's something of a little girl and it stays with me every day. I sort of wake up in the morning and that's just what, what I wanna do each day in small ways and in large ways. Um, so uh, I was able to do that serving as a producer of a, an American soap opera, who knew, uh, The Bold and the Beautiful. But I recognized at a time that we had, yes, we had 40, but at one point we had about 100 million viewers around the world uh, at one point in 100 different countries. And so we really used that as a vehicle for social change, frankly. Um, we, had, we had a captive audience and we knew that if they got to know these characters that we could thread and knit in you know, some of the important stories that need to be told to kind of impact change. Um, one a good example of this is that we we had a lot of viewers in Africa and there was the HIV um, crisis taking place there and there's a high level, level of illiteracy yet we had so many people gathered around TV 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 sets uh, all across Africa watching our TV shows so we knitted together a storyline on HIV prevention for instance and ended up receiving awards from, from the CDC, which was terrific. And we told stories on environment and domestic violence, uh, cancer prevention and all of those things. So I recognize this, which is why when they came to me and told me about, about the lab, I thought, okay, yeah, this is, you know, this is really exactly what we, we need to be doing. So, um, you know, I recognize the power of storytelling and the performance. It's, there's just no question it, it can, help shape, you know, a communal narrative that serves to to really humanize all of us that way. We've got now we have the refugee crisis, which is still taking place. We've got migration issues, environmental and climate challenges, widening disparities and the rise of racism and Islamophobia, um, anti-Semitism and, and prejudice kind of of, of all Ooh. kinds. And these prevent challenges um, that you really challenge the reach of the traditional policy approaches. So 
they need to complement those policy approaches. So the work of the lab has really provided a platform to think more broadly about politics and about international affairs. And Speaker Pelosi, oh my goodness, well, she believes in the transformative role that art can play in the world. And I, that's why she is so supportive of the efforts of the Laboratory for Global Performance and Politics. Um, I've joined you here today from my office here in, in Hollywood. I overlook the, the Hollywood sign there in the distance. I, I see the big white letters there up on the hillside. The sun is shining. They're reflecting the, the Hollywood sign right now as I'm here speaking to you. To you. Um, so this is, this is a town full of a lot of very talented leading ladies. But I like to say, Speaker Nancy Pelosi, she is America's leading lady. I have known her for a long time. I consider her a friend. I just have the utmost respect for her. She is one of the bravest people that I know. And we are so lucky um, to have her here with you, to, with us today um, to speak to David Strathairn uh, in this, this important conversation. So I recognize probably you're all at your homes and you've spent a lot of time in your homes the last the last nine months, but you're about to experiencing something, experience something really new, really very meaningful in this conversation. Um, you'll be welcoming something new into your life this evening by watching this, and it's delivered uh, this conversation by two committed people committed to improving humanity and the human condition. And so I, I just say, sit back and and enjoy the conversation. First, David, let me say uh, how remarkable your presentation of Jan Karski and remember this, the lessons of Jan Karski. It just, uh, for any of us who ever knew him or were taught by him or just had seen his lectures and the rest, you, you just, it was more than a part that you played. Uh, you took on his values, you took on his courage. And that was really a lesson of Jan Karski his courage uh, to take the chance that he did to witness what he saw and then to bear witness to it in terms of taking it to the rest of the world. And not, a, and not an easy thing to do uh, uh, at the time or ever as it appears. Uh, so again, as one who, uh, my husband, Paul, was a student of Jan Karski uh, in San Francisco, uh, we, um, respect and honor him, have a street name for him because he came many times to talk about the Holocaust there and the lessons learned. And what are those lessons to remember? It's hard to imagine that so many young people do not have full knowledge of the impact of the actual fact of the Holocaust and, um, and that this man, this Roman Catholic made the decision that he would Again, bear witness and take it all the way to the president of the United States, a different country from where you know, he's Polish and then taking it to the United States. How special a person is that? Yeah. How deeply affected he was by it and how intolerant he was of it just being not addressed at the time. Yeah, he, he, he did this under unbelievable duress, um, danger. Uh, his life was in danger constantly. Mm -hmm. He was couriering these messages to the Polish government in exile in France. And then when they decided, chose <clears throat> to send him to the West to uh, you know, hopefully have a, a meeting with Churchill, which unfortunately he didn't, but then eventually with President Roosevelt and uh, Justice Felix Frankfurter. He was uh, constantly um, uh, in danger uh, because he had so much information about what was going on, not only in Poland, but in, East, in, in all of Europe. And there were forces that did not want him to speak. Uh, so yes, his courage is, is in, in, inestimable. Um, and his dedication and his, his integrity also. Uh, it strikes me even more so today when I think about him, that he spent most of his life, the second part of his life, as teaching us um, uh, 
the importance of knowing our histories. Um, because we, if we do not know our history, we are, as they say, doomed to repeat it. But if we don't know our history, then we are lost. We have no reference to uh, who, how we have become who, uh, what we are. And uh, he, he dedicated his life to being a teacher, and that's why it's, 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 I, I'm so proud to be a part of this as, as Derek and the lab, <clears throat> um, Derek Goldman and, and the lab for um, global politics and performances, offering him to their students. Um, it's, uh, it's one thing that really strikes me, uh, not only then, but today, is the comparable uh, uh, phenomenon of, den of denial and uh, disbelief and mistrust in, uh, that, was, uh, that he encountered and that we are encountering every day, um, this trust in our uh, forms of uh, communication. And he was a, a messenger, he was a communicator. Mm -hmm. and, uh, as he said, what he spoke of may have seemed to be an ancient, terrible myth, but that all he could say is that he saw it, and it is the truth. And the truth is such a mutable and, uh, slippery thing these days. So it's, it's, it's a question that I ask is why do so many people, why are so many people choosing either to disbelieve or to uh, uh, ignore um, the truth? Um, and that's a conversation for, you know, for uh, forever. But in terms of Karski's life and how it applies today, what do you think? Why, why is that happening? Well, clearly in your, the comments you have just made, uh, it is clear to all of us that this is more than a role to you, uh, that you have uh, just become uh, Jan Karski's messenger, uh, not just in the, in the performance, uh, but in the questioning. Uh, Jan Karski was a blessing. This is a man who was brilliant. His The Secret State is required reading in our family and in our lives. We have that book every every place you turn in, a, in our family uh, or other you know, members of our family, that book is there. Uh, so he was brilliant. Uh, he was scholarly. He was courageous, as you said, about the danger, but he would not let anyone to escape the truth. Mm -hmm. And he was persistent in that regard uh, to the point of well beyond the Holocaust ending and the rest to making sure that, no, that you, we remember, that we remember. Now, I wanna say something about my father. My father was a member of Congress around the same time as Jan Karski came and saw uh, President Roosevelt uh, in um, what, like uh, April of 1943, no, March of 1943. He spoke in, in the Congress as a member of Congress and he talked about, uh, uh, he, 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 he rose to speak about a, a call to action towards stopping the wholesale slaughter of the Jewish people in youth in Europe. Again, uh, action, not pity, can save millions now. Extinction or hope for the remnants of a, a European Jewry. It is for us to give the answer daily, hourly. The greatest crime of all time is being committed. A defenseless and innocent people is being slaughtered in wholesale millions of massacre of millions. What is more tragic? The di they are dying for no reason. And he goes, I won't read the whole statement. It's 19, March 2nd, 1943 in the congressional record. But what he does say, it is a satanic program beyond the grasp of the human mind, yet it is being carried out. Already 2 million of the Jews in Germany occupied Europe, German occupied Europe have been murdered. This is the statement. The evidence is in the files of our own State Department. He declared that on the floor of the House, March 2nd, 1943, a month or so, so before Jankarski then went to see the president. So it was in the, that documentation was already there when Jan went. I mean, that is to say he gave voice to it, uh, but 
all the more reason to wonder why more wasn't done when they really truly knew. But I wish you would read this about my father. He was part of something called the Berkson Group and he, a uh, Italian American, but he spoke Yiddish. So he was like a big speaker on the circuit of talking about this issue in Yiddish to the Jewish community. And uh, again, on the floor of the house. So there, there were people who knew, and he wasn't the only one, there were people who knew. And so the question is, what do we do to make sure people remember, but how do we explain why, even though there was knowledge of this, something more wasn't done sooner to save lives? Because as we know, many lives were lost even after 1943. Uh, we saw that when we were in Auschwitz in, in uh, January for the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz how late they were still bringing people in and killing them then. So this is, the, I mean, the very idea that so many young people in our country are not aware of this uh, is something that has to be corrected. When presented with these kinds of facts, when they are at such a, uh, of such magnitude, how do we deal with them at that point? when they're almost out of control and beyond our control. Mm -hmm. Karski said, great crimes start with little things. Mm -hmm. And things like you just dislike your neighbor for some reason. And he said, don't do that. Mm -hmm. But the little things that were incrementally building to the greater knowledge of what was happening, should have been addressed. Those little things should have been addressed. And much like today, we are under such duress because things are so much seemingly out of control. But way back when, there was a time when these things started and they were nurtured and they started to grow. How do we, how do our leaders, uh, our, the ones who speak for us, our teachers, how do they what should they do and how should they do it to address these little things when they first are become aware? Because we put out, when we look at the fires in California, you know, those are decades of, 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 of ignorance and irresponsible acts and, and I'm just denial and actually just, but it's those little things yeah. that we, we, we need to flag at the moment to keep them from becoming these big conflagrations. And, and how do our leaders do that? Well, let me just uh, thank you for framing it in that way. Uh, perhaps at the time, going back to the forties, uh, there was a case to be made that they thought the most important thing they could do to end this was to win the war, was to win the war. And that may be some rationalization, not necessarily justification, but rationalization, that they thought the best thing to do would to be win the war. My question is, if the Germans had not invaded France and England, would this necessity to win the war still been there? And would this, this crimes against humanity just been part of what it is? Mm -hmm. I see that's, you know, what, what weight is that necessity? Is the necessity because of what they're harming people or the necessity because they have a, a, an expansive view of what Germany should be? Now, in, in your earlier question, when you say how to, in this day and age, when people say and do things, um, I've been fighting on human rights issues a long time and we're very proud that Jimmy Carter's uh, uh, presidency was predicated very much on human rights and spread respect for human rights and people criticized him for that, like he was a softy. But the fact is that is fundamental. And I always say, for example, when, when there are human rights violations in some place where we have economic interest, for example, China, uh, uh, when um, if, uh, if, if we don't speak out against human rights violations in a place like China, where we have strong economic interest, we lose all moral authority to speak about it any other place. Look at the Uyghurs, the Tibetans, what's happening in Hong Kong and the rest. And nonetheless, what, what I do know, David, is that one of the most 
cruel forms of torture that they exact on these people is to say, nobody even knows you're here, that you're in prison or in a prison labor camp or something. Nobody knows you're here. They don't know why you're here. They don't even know your name. So right. why don't you just come over to our side? And what we try to do is every day try to um, make sure uh, that they are not forgotten, that their names are specifically named or as a group of people named. And the um, sad thing is, oh, uh, and I hate to say this because it was so current uh, since I'm in the speaker's office and I welcome you here, uh, just a couple of weeks ago I was on the floor of the house, maybe more than a couple of weeks because of Corona, but a month ago or so on the floor of the house, speaking out against the uh, um, discrimination against Asians because that's happening in our country because of little things. Right. And, and on the other side of the aisle, they stood up and said, why is the Speaker of the House wasting the time of Congress on this subject? Hmm. So we have our own challenges in terms of the respect of the dignity and worth of every person. And as you know, others have spoken very clearly. And I'm so glad that Georgetown under uh, Dr. Jack President Jack DeJoy's leadership and the Foreign Service School under Dean Joel Hellman are putting in place, have principles, you know, principles of, of respect for the dignity and worth of every person as fundamental to whatever our domestic or foreign policy is. And that things are happening right now that we said never again. I try to figure out why he remained silent many reasons, probably, until he was <clears throat> found by Claude Landsman and, uh, and, and encouraged, uh, urged to, to speak. But when you talk about the people who don't know and uh, may have, uh, for whatever reason, don't have the impulse to speak and that they have been sort of left adrift because they are unaware I think about Karski's choice to speak because Lanzmann said he had a responsibility to speak, he had a historical responsibility. And it's in that I think we can find a lesson for the next generation that if you choose to be a citizen of a certain country, that you and you choose your leaders, that you do have a historical responsibility to speak out um, and hold everyone accountable. Um, and I, I, I'm kind of rambling here, trying to find the, the seed of, of Karski's life, but it's, it's like a, a dandelion's bloom in the, in the wind because he has so much to say about our life today, um, not only in day-to-day the -day neighborly you know the divisions in our country but also in the, uh, the halls of our government um, it's uh, it, I, 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 I just thank you for bringing some perspective to it because um, as you know if if we do not have teachers teaching us the lessons of our history and then as I said before we have no reference we have no strap hanger to hold on to to carry us forward um, uh, to make progress. Uh, well, in the regard of, of Jan Karski speaking out later, and thank heavens he was encouraged to do so, maybe by that point, I mean, when I heard him speak about it, I felt that he thought the rest of us here in Congress it was, and then other places, that we were finally worthy to hear his message. Mm. We might understand when we understand what mm. this was about. And that uh, he held it in for a long time. Well, he was outspoken at the time, but then uh, held it back. Uh, and then maybe he th thought that at last we were all worthy to hear the message that we might act upon it. And it would not be just treated as his story, but mm. something for all of us to act upon. And that um, uh, so many horrible things have happened since then, but for the Holocaust is something in its own, its own sphere 
and for us, for, for those now to, in some respects, trivialize it or not recognize it uh, for the assault on humanity that it was, is, uh, is a shortcoming on all of our part. And we have to, we all have a responsibility because we know, because we know, because he bore witness, because he had the courage to incur, in, uh, endanger himself uh, to take it to that place. And then, and then, and then when people were ready, when people were ready in his view uh, to tell the story. So let us be a lesson to us. Now, we've had some uh, nice um, events uh, in terms of your beautiful performance. Remember this. Uh, we've had the Board of Governors visitors uh, honoring his 100th birthday. Uh, we had the underground history of Jan Karski in World War II at the Churchill War Rooms. We, many of us attended that in London. And the legends of Georgetown, John Karski, and in uh, Chicago at the Polish Consul General's uh, uh, place there. And, you know, uh, and other things. Now, I don't say that to say, well, since we've had these events, then we're checking the box. No, we're spreading the word. We're spreading the word. And John Karski, it's almost like one word, John yeah. Karski. Uh, that means a challenge to the conscience. I face the truth, act upon it. And if not, why not? Why not? Because the man's inhumanity man does not go away. And that's why I'm, I'm grateful to um, uh, Derek Goldman, Professor Goldman and Ambassador Cynthia Schneider uh, for bringing this all, crystallizing this and you and your performance. Because I do believe this for all of, of the uh, lecturing and all the things we try to convey the arts are the are the way it happens with your pre, with your performance and that of others that with your performance though you took us to, you reached touched our hearts in a way that um uh, made us laugh made us cry not that much laughing but occasional made us cry inspired us in a way that just telling the story might not have in a different way. So God bless you for that, because I do believe the arts are one of the answers to it all. It unifies us because we, again, have a shared experience, forget our differences, and are taken to a new place in understanding of what this is. And it's irresistible. Hmm. And it is uh, just imperative uh, that we act upon it. So I, I am so excited that this is now going to be getting more, um, uh, there's going to be more opportunity for people to be aware through, through the arts about Jan Karski, his courage, his just determination, his, his saintliness really in some respects, because mm -hmm. people were being heard and he was not going to tolerate that without making sure everybody knew and had an opportunity to do something about it. Whether it was those people in that situation or anyone else over time, um, mm. we cannot ignore it. Oh, couldn't, I couldn't put it better, how beautiful. This is, this is more than about Jan Karski, although that would be sufficient, certainly. It's about heroism, it's about truth, it's about recognition that we have no, again, moral authority to speak mm. in terms of justice unless we are going to act upon the injustice that we see. I wanna um, thank Speaker Pelosi for taking the extraordinary time that she took for that focused conversation on our project um, and for her support of this, of this project really from the beginning and her interest in it. Um, and of course, to thank David for his part in that conversation. You know, David um, uh, is an extraordinary actor as we've addressed, but it's not everyone who can over the course of a 90 minute event grow a mustache and then shave the mustache off just within that, that time frame. So 
Um, I want to um, just I want to let people know we have a few more minutes of this program, but that um, that David there will David will perform an excerpt um, from towards the end of the play as the closing um, as of the the closing of the program, um, and I want to uh, but first turn it back to Ijoma who's gonna introduce one more of our amazing students um, to talk in light of what um, Speaker Pelosi just shared to talk about her uh, journey with us. Thank you, Derek. Um, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce one more student from our Bearing Witness course to share some of her thoughts and uh, to talk a little bit about her relationship uh, with Karski, uh, Julia Locascio. Julia. Hello. Thank you, Professor Njaka. I'm Julia Locascio, a junior in the School of Nursing and Health Stu Studies, studying human science on the pre-medical track. My first encounters with Holocaust history were conversations with my grandparents who, like Speaker Pelosi's family, grew up in Southern Italy. While they didn't witness the Holocaust directly, their stories led me to World War II investigation at a very young age, despite the fact that, as I said, I'm pursuing a career in medicine. For Karski in particular, my journey with his story actually began fall of my freshman year at Georgetown when I had the opportunity to bear witness to the theater department's production of our class. His play detailed the 1941 Yedvopny massacre and was really something I never learned about in school. From that point on, I understood the power of bearing witness to this part of history and the arts role in doing so. Like most Georgetown students, I see the statue of Young Karski on campus almost every day, but it wasn't until fall of my sophomore year that I engaged directly with his story. I was working on another play in the Davis Performing Arts Center, our central theater on campus, and expressed my interest to Professor Goldman about the Karski play. He generously invited me to a rehearsal where I got to meet Mr. Young and Mr. Strathairn and was one of the first people to see the play. It was extremely impactful to me to be the first witnessed to the first witness. Karski's story is both a lesson and a call to action. For my junior fall, I'm glad to be able to elaborate on both in our class and hear how it has impacted my fellow peers. We have all come from different backgrounds, but we all agree that what Karski said should not be taken lightly. I take his lesson a bit closer to my heart as a Catholic with, as Speaker Pelosi outlined, values of faith, hope, charity, and his general saintliness. He more than exemplified these tenets and went through extreme personal suffering for the sake of his mission. The elements of duty and sacrifice are delicately woven in every episode of his story and beautifully portrayed in the film. I hope I can be as exemplary a Catholic scholar and witness as he was, or at the very least, continue working toward a future where stories like his are preserved, heard, and respected. I think his legacy is a call to duty for us all. Sadly, for the same issue that to which he had to bear witness, though thankfully not on that scale. Anti-Semitic attacks are rising in our world. And I say our world because it is ours to defend and care for, especially as young people. Jan Karsi was just 26 when he was sent out with the Polish army and only 29 when he spoke to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. For me and for all of us, his legacy means no excuses when it comes to engaging and promoting Holocaust education. This effort should cross party and religious lines, international borders and majors. As I mentioned earlier, I'm a scientist and trade by study. Here I am. <laughs> so, through the opportunities afforded to me from my very first semester at Georgetown up to now, I'm ready and eager to continue advocating for Holocaust education through the legacy of this insignificant little man. Though as we can all see, he most certainly was not. Thank you. Thank you, Julia, so much. Julia, thank you so much. You know, it's a sort of a uh, idiom that people say that uh, professors learn as, as much from their students as their students learn from them. But I hope all of you out there can see that at Georgetown, it's simply true. It's just simply true, we do. Thank you so much, all the students. You've contributed so much. Uh, and thanks, I'm gonna add my, my thanks to Derek, David and Clark who have been working on this project for years and years in so many different circumstances and have, it just grows and grows and becomes richer and richer. And Ava, that you put that film together in five days of shooting 
is simply unbelievable. So it's so great to have you as part of this fantastic project also. David, I'm going to ask you for one real life reflection. We've got, we got to see you speaking with the speaker, but, and we're going to see you again um, in Karski's uh, embodiment, but I think people would love to hear from you in real life. And it would be great if you would just reflect in any way you'd like uh, about your experience with this story over the years, whether it's the film, the performance, its evolution, its paring down to a one-man show, or and or your experience with the students uh, in the Bearing Witness course. Uh, thanks, Cynthia. I, <clears throat> well, it, it has been a long journey. It's been an extraordinary privilege. Uh, it's been uh, daunting. It's been enlightening. It's been extraordinarily moving. Um, but I want to go to the end of that list and say that what I've heard tonight from Julia and Amina and Leigh and, and Dominic and, and is, is, is testament that we did something worthwhile. Um, extraordinary that if this piece can elicit this kind of articulate and insightful, incisive response, um, I'm overwhelmed by, the, by these four and I'm sure there are many more. But if, if we, this is the joy of doing it. This is why we, we do it. Um, this is what the arts can do. The arts can, can they can create an empathic space whereby people like Lee and Dominic and Amina and Julia can articulate the viscera for so many people. And that's extraordinary to me. And it, it's, it's a gift that's given back through all our efforts to bring this man who gave us all a gift to acknowledge everything that he's, he's talked about. Um, I, I first, as Derek told you, I first was aware of him um, when I first saw Shoah and it stuck with me. Uh, it kind of, I was in a fog for days after, weeks after, and, and, uh, and to have come this far, I think is, is one of the, one of the most important things in arcs of, of my life as, as a performer, but also as, as a person learning about him. Um, I don't know how much time we have, but I, I have this little piece that I, I just, it's a, one of my favorite poems and it's been with me, but then I started doing Karski and it has a resonance to me in a very simple way. It's by Marge Piercy. And I don't know if we have time to do it. I could just do a couple excerpts from it. Um, Go for it, David. No right. one's, no one's going to stop you now. Yeah, well, all right. I don't no, know. No, no, seriously, I, we'd love to hear it. Um, <clears throat> on the birthday of the world, I began to contemplate what I have done and left undone. But this year, not so much rebuilding of my perennial damaged psyche, shoring up eroding friendships, digging out stumps of old resentments that refuse to rot on their own. No, this year I want to call myself to task for what I have done and not done for peace. How much have I dared in opposition? How much have I put on the line for freedom, for mine and for others? Are these, as these freedoms are paired and sliced and diced, where have I spoken out? Who have I tried to move? In this holy season, I stand self-convicted of sloth in a time when lies choke the mind and rhetoric bends reason to slithering, choking pythons. Here I stand before the gates opening, the fire dazzling my eyes, and as I approach what judges me, I judge myself. Give me weapons of minute destruction. Let my words turn into sparks. 
And what I've heard tonight is sparklers all over the place from you guys. Um, so carry it forth. It's just, it's great. Love you. Thank you, David. I'm so glad. I know we talked about weather. I'm just so, so glad you shared that. It's so, it's so perfect for, and it's, it's absolutely right that this, the sparks are, are flying. Yeah. Um, I want to just take this moment. We have a few more minutes, uh, so don't go away. Uh, because there's more David, but I want to just take this moment to thank everyone who made this event possible. This is a production, a virtual production, but to sort of pull the threads together, it actually takes a lot of people. Um, I can't actually acknowledge all of them, but I want to especially single out some of our lab family, our student team, Alyssa Cardos and Rennie Simone, who are amazing, as well as Toby Clark, who is the master of the, the Zoom um, the Zoom world here, and Sarah Janetti, and also members of our lab family, Emma Crane-Jaster and Melly Colomb, and there are many others, but that's a group that has really um, dug deep in as part of the family of this of this project. Um, you know, the lab, I think, is, is unique as an arts initiative at this intersection that you've been experiencing and hearing about tonight. And that for all kinds of reasons, especially because of our students, um, could kind of only happen at Georgetown with students with the kind of dual passions that these students bring, not only for the arts, but about how the arts matter in the world. Um, it also takes for something like this to grow and thrive as someone who's been at Georgetown for 16 years, it takes leaders who actually get it and who believe in it and who understand the power across these schools and these boundaries. And we've been sort of at the moment, I can almost say we've been triply blessed. I'm, I'm my home department though. I am honored to have a joint appointment in the School of Foreign Services in the Department of Performing Arts and in the college. And there we've had uh, Dean Chris Chalenza and now have um, soon to be interim Dean, my colleague uh, in Performing Arts uh, and in African-American studies, Salika Colbert, who've both deeply gotten it. And then um, our great colleague in the School of Foreign Service, who from arriving at Georgetown, and it's actually the first time I met Joel, and I'm just thinking of this at the moment, was in the Harmon Center, sitting in front of me as we were preparing to perform an earlier version of Karski. Um, and he has, uh, Long before that, he deeply understood what we were doing and the power of narrative and its relevance for the School of Foreign Service. And we've been really blessed by that. And I want to um, uh, hand it over to Joel um, for a moment. I'll hand it back to David. Thank you all so, so much for being part of tonight. Well, thank you, David, for that lovely introduction. And thank you so much for sandwiching my remarks between David's moving Academy Award nominated um, reading and performance um, and his final performance. Um, I'm bookended um, by an extraordinary man and communicator, uh, but I'm pleased to be able to do it. You know, I'm here just to talk a little bit about the School of Foreign Service because to some extent, if any single life can encapsulate the story of the School of Foreign Service, it is really the life of Jan Karski. He did live the turbulence of the first century of the school's being. He bore witness to the worst of humanity. He understood the perils when the world order collapses. And he sought to enlighten the world at great personal sacrifice and risk. And after the war, what's so remarkable is that he dedicated his life to ensuring that the next generations would never let what he witnessed happen again. And that's so critical to our mission. It's, it's really important for me to recognize, because I'm sure we have so many Georgetown alumni in the audience, that all who knew him uh, spoke of his humanity. They spoke of his humor. They spoke of his warmth. They spoke of his intellectual acuity and his deep commitment to human dignity. His was lived history. And as I meet Georgetown alumni from all over the world, I always ask them about the moments that they remember most about Georgetown, the moments that transform them. And Jan Karski keeps coming up again and again. Uh, they recite from his lectures. They launch into bad imitations of his Polish accent and his noble demeanor. They repeat his jokes. As Madam Speaker mentioned, there, were, there was much to laugh at from what I understand from Jan Karski and, his, and being in his presence. And they tell of the inspiration that he instilled upon them 
to impact others. So he was core to our school and I'm so pleased to say, as you saw tonight by these remarkable students, that the spirit of Karski lives on at Georgetown and at SFS. And especially in the aftermath of this summer of turmoil with a national reckoning on racism and injustice, our students and faculty got together to craft a call to action to make the global struggle against racism and injustice a core founding principle of our school's second century. They wanted to recognize how our curriculum and our community can engage and integrate the study of global affairs with the continued struggle against racism and injustice and a recognition that we need to continually renew this understanding. The need and the recognition that we need to listen we cannot remain silent. We need to bear witness to the experience of those marginalized. And we need to remind ourselves of the moral imperative to improve the human condition. Karski's legacy is as vital today as it ever was. And so it's entirely fitting that the Laboratory for Global Politics and Performance led by Derek Goldman and Cynthia Schneider, whose mission is to humanize politics, has focused on the life of Karski, whose own mission was really to make us realize our own humanity. So you've seen how the lab mobilizes the power of performance, you've seen how it inspires students, and you see its mission to promote empathy and understanding of global politics. And by doing that to help heal the polarizing divisions of our time. Have we ever needed this more? So let me thank all of you for joining us here this evening to celebrate Karski. Let me thank the creators involved in this extraordinary endeavor. Let me thank the teachers who were involved in inspiring these students. Let me thank the students themselves for their testimony. Let me thank Ambassador Bell and Madam Speaker. And let's of course end with the incomparable David Strathairn, who has given so much to this project with a final glimpse of the man himself. Thank you very much. When I left the White House, uh, on that day in 1943. President Roosevelt was still smiling and fresh. I felt fatigued. It was, however, not an ordinary fatigue, but rather the satisfied weariness of the workman who has just completed his job with the last blow of his hammer or the artist who signs his name beneath the completed picture. Something was coming to an end and all that remained was this, this weariness. I walked across Pennsylvania Avenue to Lafayette Square. I sat down on a bench and watched the people go by. They were well dressed and looked healthy and complacent. They didn't seem affected by the war. Events passed through my mind in quick, strange fragments. The memories bringing nausea, the ghetto and the death camp and the whispered words, remember this, remember this, remember.